Let's define something called the center of a group. If G is a group, then the center of G, denoted by Z of G, is given by the set of all elements A that are in G, such that A times B equals B times A for all elements B in the group G. So what does that mean? It means we're looking for elements in G that commute with all the other elements in G. Okay, let's look at an example. How about the group Z4? So here's the group table for Z4. Let's try and find the center of Z4. Okay, so we are looking for the center Z of Z4. And by the way, the notation for the center, uh, this Z of G, is not unique. I've seen uh, some people call the center C instead. Uh, but okay, let's try and find the center of Z4. So we want all the things that commute with all the other elements. Well, I think it's clear that the identity element is going to commute with everything. So it seems like the identity is always going to be in the center. So I can say for sure that in this case, zero, which is playing the role of our identity element here, uh, that's going to be in here. So we can say that we know for sure zero is in here. What about one? Well, let's see, one here, it looks like um, one and two give three, and two and one give three, and one and three give zero, and three and one give zero, so yeah, it looks like one would be in there. How about two? Uh, well, two and one give three, one and two give three, uh, 2 and 3 give 1, 3 and 2 give 1. That looks like that commutes with everything. And I think you can check for yourself that 3 is also in there. So it looks like in this particular case, we just ended up getting the entire group. Now that's not uh, so unusual here if you think about it. This group here is abelian. That means every element commutes with every other element. So if we happen to have an abelian group, so if we know that G itself is abelian, meaning that every element in G commutes with every other element in G, then we can say for sure that the center of G is going to be just the group itself. So that's not very exciting. Let's see if we can get a more exciting case. Maybe if we try something that's non-abelian. Okay, so here's our definition of the center of a group. And now let's look at the group S3. If you remember, that's the group of symmetries on an equilateral triangle. Here is the group table for S3. And now we're going to try and find the center of S3. So like I said before, it's, it's pretty clear that the identity element, which in this case is rho naught, that's going to be in the center. So if we're looking for the center of S3, we can say for sure, for sure, that we are definitely going to have the identity element. So that would be rho 0. But do we have anything else? So let's look at row one. So row one right here. Uh, well, how about uh, row one and mu one? So if we look at row one, mu one, what do we get? So row one starting on the left over here and then mu one is mu three. All right. And what about uh, mu one, row one? Does that work? So mu1 rho1 is mu2. So it looks like rho1, no good. How about rho2? Okay, so rho2, let's pick an element here that uh, maybe one of these mu's here. How about, uh, well, we can do it again with mu1. How about, does rho2 commute with mu1? So rho2 and mu1, that gives us mu2. Okay, and what if we do it the other way around? How about row, or mu1, rho2? Does that also give us mu2? So mu1, rho2, nope, that gives us mu3. So it looks like rho2, no good. Okay, well, we didn't have any luck with the rows. How about the mu's? Maybe the mu's will work. Well, we just saw that mu1 and rho1, it didn't commute. Uh, they don't. They didn't commute here, so we know mu1 can't be in the center here, so mu1, no good. How about mu2? So let's try mu2 together with uh, about row 1. 
Well, we kind of know that this probably shouldn't work. Let's check it anyway. So we have mu2 and row 1 that gives mu3. And what about row 1 with mu2? Does that work? Row 1 with mu2, that's mu1. So nope, mu2, no good. And you can check for yourself, mu3, that's also no good. So that's it. Our center, well, that's just the identity element. That's not very exciting. So it looks like when we have an abelian group, we have the center as the entire group. We just saw an example where we have a non-abelian group and the center was just the identity element. Is it possible to have the center be anything other than the entire group or just the identity element? Let's look at one more example. Let's look at D4. So this was the group of symmetries on a square. So here's the group table for D4. And we're gonna try and find the center of D4. So the center of D4, Z of D4, okay. So we know for sure we have the identity element, which was row zero for this group, but do we have anything else? So let's see here. Well, let's try row one. So how about uh, row one and mu one? So what does that give us? So row one, mu one, that's delta one, okay. And then how about mu one, row one? So let's see if row one commutes with mu one. So now we have mu one, row one, that's delta two, no good. So we can see row one, nope, not in the center. How about row two? So let's see, how about row two? Well, let's, let's kind of look at the rows here at least here. So row two and row one, that's row three, and row one and row two is row three. Well, that seems to work. How about row two and row three? So row two and row three give row one, and row three and row two give row one. This is looking promising, okay. Let's do an example here looking at the one of the mu's. How about row two and mu one? So row two and mu one, that's mu two, all right. And now let's try it the other way around row one, I'm sorry, mu one and row two. And is that gonna give us mu two? Let's check. Mu one and row two, it gives us mu two. All right, this is looking good. So if you go through the rest of these, I won't, I won't write them all out here, but we'll kind of look at the, the, the uh, group table. Row two and mu two is mu one. Mu two and row two, that's also mu one. And then if we look at row two with the deltas, row two and delta one is delta two. And delta one and row two is also delta two. And then finally, row two and delta two is delta one. And delta two, row two is also delta one. So it looks like we do have another element in the center here. We can say row two is in there. If you go through and you check the rest of these, it turns out nothing else really works. We end up just with these two elements being in the center, but we see that we have a non-trivial center here. So it is possible to get a center that is more than just uh, the identity element or the entire group itself. So it turns out that the center Z of G of a group G is a subgroup of G. So if we wanted to actually prove this uh, theorem here, we would need to show that uh, Z of G is a subgroup of G, and to show something is a subgroup, we can use the subgroup test. So the subgroup test says a non-empty subset H of a group G is a subgroup of G if and only if the following properties hold, and we have closure and inverses. Okay, well one thing uh, right off the bat, we see non-empty subset. Well, we know that the identity element E is definitely gonna be inside the center. We saw that already before. So we have something that's non-empty, but now we need to check closure and we need to check inverses. Okay, so let's just do a, a sketch of a proof here and then I'll do a formal proof. So first let's check closure. What does closure mean? Well, that means that if we take any two elements in the center and we uh, do the binary operation on them, we should get something else that's in the center. 
So let's uh, pick two elements here. How about X and Y? We'll use letters uh, different from the, the A and the B that we have up here. Well, let's say those are in the center. And we need to show then, we have to show that X times Y is in the center. Okay, so how are we gonna show that? Well, uh, we know that these uh, X and Ys, if they're in the center, are gonna commute with any element that's in G. So if C, say, is some element in G, we know that X times C is C times X, and we know that Y times C is C times Y. So we need to show that X, Y times C is C times X, Y. This is what we have to show right here, this, this condition. Okay, so how are we gonna show that? Well, how about if we use these two properties here and I can kind of rearrange things here so that I group the Y and the C together. So I'm using the associative property here and you might wonder, well, I didn't show that yet. How do I know I can use it? But remember, X, Y, and C are all in the group G and since G is a group, it is associative. So I don't have to worry about that. But now I can just kind of move things around here. So the Y and the C commute, so I get C, Y and then I can kind of change it around so I group the X and the C together and then I can change the order of those and then I'm done. I have C times X, Y. Great, okay. How about inverses? So I have to do a similar thing. If I know that X is some element of the center, I have to show that the inverse of X is also in the center. So X inverse is also in the center. Okay, how am I gonna show that? Well, let's see here. I have to show that X inverse uh, is in the center, which means it commutes with every element in G. So again, I'm gonna have to use some property uh, that involves an element of G. So let's say C again is some element of G. Well, I know that that's true if X is in the center, then X times C equals C times X. And I also know that if C is in the group G, I know that C inverse is in the group G which means that I can say that X C inverse equals C inverse X, since X is in the center, it commutes with every element, including the inverse of C. Okay, so now I need to show that X inverse and some element C is equal to C X inverse. That's what I have to show. How am I gonna do that? Well, let's see, X inverse and C. Well, whenever I see inverses, there's a good trick you can always use. That's using this idea here. If you have A times B inverse, that's the same thing as B inverse A inverse. And that's, a, that's something that whenever you see any uh, proof involving inverses, there's a good chance something like that's gonna come up. So if I can kind of rewrite this to use this idea here, maybe it would work. So how about if I say that this is like X inverse and this is C inverse inverse. That's the same thing, right? Now this looks kind of like this so I can kind of turn it into that. In other words, I can rewrite this so that I have something that looks like C inverse X inverse. And now I'm good to change these around because remember, C inverse X is the same thing as X C inverse. So that's X C inverse, whole thing inverse. And now I can undo this that I was doing here before. And if I do that, then the order switches again and I get C inverse inverse X inverse, but C inverse inverse is just C. So this is C X inverse. And I'm done. I think it's time for a formal proof. Okay, so for the formal proof here, uh, here's the theorem, the center Z of G of a group G is a subgroup of G. And I am first gonna note that the identity element that's, uh, I'm gonna denote as E here. I know that E is in the center, so I know that the center is non-empty. So now I'm okay to use the subgroup test. So for the subgroup test, I have to show that the center is closed and that any element of the center also has an inverse in the center. So let's break it down into closure and inverses. So first, closure. Let's let X and Y be any two elements in the center. And then I know that X times C equals C times X and y times c equals c times y for any element c that's in g, and that's just going by the definition of what it means to be in the center. So now I can do that thing where I kind of group things together, so I get x times y times c, and then I can change the grouping around and change the ordering just like we did before, 
And if you see, you end up getting C times X times Y. So this is great. This is what I wanted to show. So this implies that X times Y is in the center. And so the center is closed. Okay, how about inverses? Well, let's let X be an element of the center. Then I know that since X is in the center, X times C equals C times X for any element C that's in G. And if C is in G, then I know that C inverse is also in G because G is a group, and if it's a group, then it has inverses. So now I can do this trick here. And this, remember, was the trick that I was doing whenever you see inverses, and I'll just remind you that's this idea that A times B inverse is the same thing as B inverse A inverse. That's the, the trick that I'm using here. So that allows me to turn X inverse C into C X inverse. This implies that X inverse is in the center, and that means that the inverse of any element of the center is also in the center, and therefore the center is a subgroup of G.